time now for the week that was. Let's take a look at top stories that made headlines across the globe this week. Starting with President Bola Tinubu, who was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, at the start of this week to take part in a special session of the World Economic Forum. On that occasion, the president spoke about the greater need for, for greater international cooperation and inclusiveness, as well as his commitment to economic collaboration and inclusivity. Tinubu also defended his economic reforms since assuming office. State House correspondent Adesua Omoruan reports. The World Economic Forum's special meeting in Riyadh began on Sunday amidst global concerns including the Gaza conflict, energy transitions and geopolitical tensions. During the plenary session titled A New Vision for Global Development, IMF Managing Director highlights the need for reforms to address weak growth rates and significant divergences. We face two very serious problems. The first one is the one that you outlined. Growth, yes, 3.2% for this year, but really weak by historical standards. And two, significant divergence across the world. Some countries doing really well and others falling behind. To remove the President Bola Tinubu, in his remarks, addressed the economic policies implemented since assuming office, especially focusing on the contentious issue of subsidy removal. He emphasized the government's commitment to mitigating the impact on vulnerable populations while justifying the currency management as crucial measures to eliminate arbitrage and corruption. There's no doubt that it was a necessary action for my country not to go bankrupt. One, to reset the economy and the pathway to growth. It is going to be difficult, but the hallmark of leadership is taking difficult decisions at the time it ought to be taken decisively. We were able to manage that and practice the economic drawback and the fallout of the subsidy removal. Equally, it engendered transparency, accountability, and physical discipline for the country. In discussing global cooperation, President Tinubu stresses the importance of inclusivity in capital formation, just as his Rwandan counterpart criticizes what he calls the hypocrisy of the developed countries, while urging Africa to avoid a victim mentality. Capital formation that is necessary to drive the economy, like agriculture, food security, uh, innovation, technology advancement must be an inclusive program of the entire world. Mm. Mm. No one should be left behind. The inclusiveness that we are talking about and getting and collaboration that brings different entities of the world together. So for that, we must be able to call out hypocrisy for what whenever we see it, and it is there because we keep talking about north-south divide or other divides, but we don't find easily and quickly the solution to that. Yet we can. We, we, we know that we can do that. Now, one, two things have to happen. The rest of the world have got to see that this is an important place to invest with and invest in. That's one. Second is for Africa itself to avoid any victim mentality mm -hmm. and uh, start raising themselves, ourselves, to the level where we should be, and in fact, where we are. Is there any way uh, we can see a stabilization uh, in your surroundings uh, in the years to come, or is it, uh, does it look uh, very, very grim? 
Uh, thank you very much. We are encouraging uh, in entire school to pay attention to SAE and, uh, and the countries around us and ECOWAS. As the chairman of the ECOWAS, I've with uh, the big influence of uh, Nigeria to discourage unconstitutional change of government. That is stabilizing. Uh, equally, we have eased the sanctions. We need to trade with one another, not fight each other. It is very, very necessary. As the world paid attention to the poverty level of Sae and the rest of ECOWAS, are we going to pay only a big brother's role in a talk show without necessary action? The forum themed global collaboration, growth, and energy for development has gathered leaders from various sectors to discuss global development strategies. Adesua, Omoruan, Arise News. That was a great one from Adesua. Um, we did take it live last yes. weekend at Tinubu Atwerf and he spoke about the need for his government to communicate with the people rapidly. Obviously, he spoke about the in inclusivity in global politics and investment. And he also spoke about collaboration and transparency and fiscal discipline. However, he spoke about finding the true value of the currency and finding the true value of the Naira. And it seems even just recently we have the customs um, raising the, the dollar rate and the, you know, the Naira has fallen according to custom rates right now, whereas the CBN is still fighting uh, to reduce you know, the value of the Naira. So it does seem that even within the federal government and within the Tunubu administration, there is not entirely coherence or collaboration so before he asked for the international community to collaborate with Nigeria, yeah. he might need to require <laughs> his own agencies to collaborate with each other to make sure that they are will, on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think, I think, you know, I do think we must ask our president that there should be collaboration and transparency in-house. <laughs> yes, and the call is coming from inside at this point. Yeah. We need coherent policy and coherent policy um, adopt, adaptation yeah. across board. And we're even seeing this with the fuel scarcity. So it, it seems to be an issue issue with, you know, without before you go to Riyadh and before you go to Saudi Arabia and ask the world to collaborate with you and to come to the table to meet you, you might want to have a family meeting <laughs> and make sure that we're doing it at home. Absolutely. I mean, uh, very well said. We did, as you uh, reminded us, we did take this live uh, last week Sunday yes. you know, when, when the president was in Saudi Arabia. And of course, we did commend him uh, more for uh, the fact that he was able to disappoint naysayers you know, who uh, probably were wondering that, oh, let's see what uh, he will be like on a global stage. Mm. Uh, and I think that was an important outing. But of course, you know, almost a week after that uh, important meeting in Saudi Arabia, a lot of things, you know, uh, have happened. Um, we have marked the Labor Day uh, without him being around, mm. um, you know, and of course that can uh, raise some concerns as to, oh, after leaving uh, Amsterdam, for uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, where's the president? You know, I, I think that we've mentioned this a number of times on this program. Um, I, I do not think that it's good strategy to uh, leave room for speculation. Uh, is he returning directly to Nigeria? If he was not going to be around on May Day, uh, yes, he did deliver an important and a beautiful uh, message to, to workers that raised their hopes. But of course, given what you have said in Saudi Arabia, um, um, People have to uh, re-engage, mm. you know, with with what you have said. Maybe it would be better if he had returned. We don't know. People have speculations as to maybe the president branched over, you know, in France. And, and this is the point why it is important to say uh, uh, to say that beyond reiterating the fact that you need to find the value of the naira, how by reiterating and committing to finding the value of an average worker or an average Nigeria in terms of what, you know, uh, take home can actually take them home. Mm. Uh, uh, we failed, or the federal government failed, to announce uh, a specific minimum wage on Workers' Day. Maybe as 
has been speculated. Maybe the president is waiting for his first anniversary on the 30, uh, on the 29th of May. But he did announce uh, some wage awards and stuff, which is not the same thing, you know, as minimum wage. So, uh, president spoke well in Saudi Arabia. We do not know where he has branched over to. Uh, workers and Nigerians are worried uh, as to the true value, the worth of their being, and therefore there is the room to continue to engage uh, with the reforms that the president is so much passionate about. It Definitely. is beyond reform because at the end of the day, uh, if reforms are going to stifle lives out of people, maybe it will need a review, maybe it will require much more than singing that song to the international committee. Maybe it will require, like this who has said, coming back home and, you know, tighten, have coherence, you know, around your team so that everybody will know that if Customs is saying this, if CBN is saying this, if uh, the National, uh, National Assembly is saying this, everybody is on the same page as to the betterment of Nigerians, not just Nigerian workers, of every Nigerian. That is a major duty that the president would need to work on, I believe. Definitely. I mean, you've both touched on it uh, spot on. In his op opening remarks, he did uh, keep on reiterating the need why he, it was important for his administration to, of course, take, take away few subsidies. He spoke about the com uh, capital formation uh, right now being necessary to drive the economy in spaces of uh, agriculture, food uh, innovation, security, te technological advancement. But because you've touched on all of that, I think one thing that really stood out to me was him um, making reference to you know what was going on as him being the chairman of ECOWAS and what's going on in the Sahel region, and he reiterated that you know even he's been able to wield the big influence of Nigeria, you know, uh, and of course fighting against this unconstitutional change of government, and he also uh, spoke about it's being very very necessary and compulsory to continue to engender growth and stability and economic prosperity across the regions. So we're not fighting with them. We've reduced our sanctions. We know everything that happened <laughs> or when you know this particular coup uh, happened in, in these different countries where it was just first it felt like an attack but now I think he's reeled it back in and he's now starting to realize that it's about conversation and making sure that um, Nigeria and these other countries are not You're at right. you know are not at loggerheads. So uh, that was very important. I felt that he addressed that on um, the national stage and like I mean you've rightly said Come back to Nigeria. We have a lot <laughs> more work to do. We've already touched on, you know, what's going on with the NLC and yes. the minimum wage, and we'll probably still talk about it this morning. Uh, we don't know where he branched to, but I'm sure uh, we'll, <laughs> we don't know if he branched anywhere. <laughs> right. But I'm sure we'll find out uh, soon enough. Absolutely. All right, we move on. Uh, as public outcry thickens over the trending video of an Abuja student being bullied by her colleagues, the federal government, through the Minister of State for Education, has read the riot act on bullying of all shades in Nigerian schools. Our rights correspondent, Mary Chinda, takes a look at the trend and reports. The trending video of a young student being bullied created public alcohol this week. Bullying is a social problem for adolescents with many adverse short-term and long-term effects. Bullying is categorized into physical bullying, verbal bullying, cyber bullying, and relational bullying. That's rumor spreading and social exclusion. In the United States, one in five students between the age of 12 to 18 has been bullied during the school year. Approximately 160,000 teens have skipped school year because of bullying. Research shows that students who reported that they were frequently bullied scored lower in reading, mathematics and science than their peers who reported that they were never or rarely bullied. These statistics are according to the U.S. Research Organization, National Center for Education Statistics and the Bureau of Justice Statistics. In Nigeria, school bullying is now on the rise and parents are having none of it. The one swift action by the education authorities. Bullying as a factor is a level of indiscipline from the homes. More than two, three of them were mounting on that girl and she kept her cool. That is to show you the kind of background that lady herself had. And if they were doing that, if she had retaliated, if you go to the police system, they will tell you it is too fighting. Failure on the part of parents. And uh, secondly, uh, it appears to me that those people are practicing courtism. 
because before you before they come, I mean, uh, team up to be bullying a particular person, a student, so to say, it, it shows that they already something they be doing or they be practicing. School bullying is a bad habit because in the process of bullying that child, you might injure the child or you might be expelled from the school, which is not the the proper thing to do in the school. Your parent had been sent to school for you to learn not to bully a student. So even the school should learn how to to make sure there is no bullying in the school. Arise News visits the Ministry of Education to find out just how exactly the federal government is handling the increasing menace. The ministry have guidelines for all those. You see, once one is confirmed that he has done, Depending on the gravity, it can lead to an outright termination of appointment and expulsion. And once that is done now, we we'll also follow it up with prosecution because it's right. You see, it now becomes a civil offense. The Minister of Education says though the ministry doesn't have the legal rights to prosecute, it will see that justice is served as it has set up a committee to bring the perpetrators of the Abuja school bullying case to justice. So even in this case, we have to constitute a committee. And we have constituted the seven months committee. And those committees are people that we have seen. They are technocrats in the field of education. They have gone out so much experience to be able to uncover whether there is negligence from the part of the school or not. UNESCO has defined the year 2024 as the year of education and the year for education. Now, with increasing cases of school bullying across uh, schools in the FCT and across Nigeria, experts continue to worry that this trend might as well deem the hope of the federal government's pursuit to see to the fact that 13.5 million out of school children are sent back to the classroom in the coming months. From the Federal Ministry of Education here in Abuja, Nigeria, Mary Chinda reporting for Arise News. Um, you know, this for me is, is a story that is rather disheartening. You know, it is not something that, um, uh, that, you're, that, that you're even very happy to talk about. You know? um, and I'm speaking first in terms of the essence of the story. And I also think that in some way as a professional in the way that it has been packaged. Um, we were discussing off air, uh, and I think that it is worth mentioning that um, that, that report could have been packaged you know, far better um, because of the uh, ages sensitive of nature. the, the yeah. sensitive issue and the ages of the uh, young lads, you know, kids, you know, basically speaking, you know, minors uh, that are involved. But having said that, uh, I, I, I am impressed at least uh, that the Ministry of Education, you know, uh, is stepping in, reading route out to uh, those affected, uh, and you know, obviously uh, trying to take control uh, rather than the, you know, merry go rounding and the gallivanting of you know the colleague minister of the education, the the woman from Women Affairs, you know, who tried to hijack the whole process uh, without any uh, concrete thing being done. Uh, so I hope that there will be justice. Um, a lot of people have been expressing views, and I also think that it is not just one uh, girl that that, you know, that was involved. Uh, there were at least two of them, uh, or three, as as we have been told, uh, that descended on that innocent girl. I, I think that uh, it's not something that should be taken lightly. Uh, it is beyond apology. It is about resetting. Uh, the mindset of people who can descend so low as to bully um, um, and obviously were brought up, you know, a young girl, a colleague of theirs, you know, schoolmate of theirs. Uh, I think that the Ministry of Education should go the old log in ensuring that justice is done, uh, even if it requires that um, uh, uh, the bullies, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, 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 dealt with in a way that this will serve as a deterrent to others. I mean, definitely. When you think about it, I, I, we're discussing it off air, and it's not something that you know that makes you happy when you see 
someone being harassed like that and everybody has commended her about being cool and that's okay but then again i think outside of the riot act we just really need to hone in again on our educational systems and what happens really in these boarding schools these children are you know they have access to the internet they see all sorts of things even when you think about the instigator in this particular story who was doing the bullying you, you know, you have to kind of think about the mental psyche, like what's going on in her head that makes her feel it's okay to treat her fellow classmates or, you know, even schoolmates like that. So there are, set, there, are, there are different levels from the family, from the home, and even with the teachers as well. We saw similar cases happen in Doan. In fact, that particular story ended yes. up in a child losing his life. Mm. And we saw, I mean, not, not bullying in the sense, but we saw also a similar story in Christland where there were children that were left unattended and were engaging in acts that they shouldn't have been. So it really speaks to something wrong, especially when we look at the um, primary and secondary school education. These are children that are in their formative years. So outside of the education, you know, which is what they are there for, there are other elements that need to be looked into. And it's a good development seeing this riot act being read out. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but when I was in secondary school, this was actually, I was saying it while we were off air that this is something that I saw a lot. I went to federal, a federal school, an all-girls school, and it was just almost natural to see the older students bully the younger students for basic things, you know, going to fetch water, you know, basically turning your younger ones to your personal to your personal mates and I, I the seniority concept yeah. exactly seniority why are you thinking about seniority we are in school focus on your school work and I was able to scale you know scale out of it's probably one or two hospital visits in my six years of secondary school and I'm thankful I was, I was able to go past that but there are people that might not survive that and only God knows how much of uh, how much of a, of a mental trauma, trauma yeah. that, that has actually put you know these kids through so outside of that I think they need to just look into how they can protect these kids while they're under the, you know, the care of these teachers and, you know, these teachers, so Definitely. to speak. Yeah. I think I like what you said about also your own experience. I went to boarding school as well. I had a similar experience. You know, you've been thrown inside a gutter or, or asked or to, to fill a, a, bas a basket with water <laughs> in the middle of the night. But I also think that it goes to speaking about culture and what, you know, what cultural values are being imbibed in the children. Oftentimes, people who are bullying have been bullied themselves. Exactly. And we have to remember that children are vulnerable including the bully is a child this is a minor these are individuals that should be protected right and we need to stay away from jungle justice from social media mobs especially when it comes to the to children we need children's privacy protected we yes. need policy beyond behind that and i think you know it's, it's good to call out the minister of women affairs who seems to just enjoy a press briefing and um, because when it, she's also she's wo minister of women affairs and children you know, yeah. she also has to do with children as well and poverty alleviation for children. And these are the most vulnerable members of our society. Yes. And we should not leave them to be, you know, to have their faces or yeah. their names splashed about on the internet or on the media. I think it's absolutely reprehensible. I think that when we're also talking, we don't know we don't even know what the perpetrators have been victims of themselves exactly. prior to this. And we also don't need to have so many situations that are, you know, trial by media or mm. trial by social media more mm -hmm. so, yeah. you know, especially when it comes to children and their future. Mm -hmm. And the people who are ultimately responsible are always going to be the administration. It's always going to be the school it policy. Is you know, yes. it is their absolute duty of care. Yeah. And also parents have a duty of care to their children and to the other children in classes with their children yeah. to yes. make sure that they are also training their children in a way yeah. that they respect other yeah. human yeah. beings. Yeah. So I, I I think for me that the most the people we should be protecting the most here are our children, all yeah. of them, even the ones yeah. who may be doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Definitely. And because just, and yeah. Yeah. But but very quickly too, it also speaks to um, how much of um, uh, allowance schools give to usage of of phones, you know, in schools, whether uh, in classes or in their residences. We know certain schools that would say it's a no no, we won't allow it. Evidence of that is what we saw. Somebody sat down there recording what was going on. And it's a, it's a global malaise. We see it all the time uh, on social media, you know, even in the so-called civilized societies. Mm -hmm. uh, something happens, a bully or bullies, a set of bullies descend 
on an innocent person and somebody is there, you know, either, you know, live streaming or just recording and sharing among themselves, you know, to laugh about it. Here that we know that uh, many of our young ones are still ver very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I think this should remind uh, the authorities and school authorities in particular about the need to curb excessive use, mm -hmm. excessive access to uh, a use of phones uh, by people, you know, uh, you know, I mean, in, in their care. In, exactly, in their care. Well, but some would argue that if there was nobody recording, this story might not have have, co have, have come out, might have just happened so, in the yeah. enclave of their... Of their what is the result center of the story? Exactly. Do we have anti-bullying policies coming out from the ministry or do we yeah. just have riots as it being read to mm. one particular school? Because there is no way that bullying is an isolated incident. Oh, definitely. It isn't. You know? it's and it's so isn't. You'll we, be shocked what happens in public schools. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And so All we're just having knee-jerk... <laughs> exactly. yes. We're having knee-jerk reactions by the yeah. people in power instead of them implementing actual policy, yeah. instead of them being proactive. Yeah. You know, they, we have... The to hold them accountable. The Definitely. Minister of Education should, and the Minister of Women Affairs should not go to one particular school and read them the Riots Act because at the end of the day, that results in nothing. Definitely. We need them to be intentional and proactive and protect our children. Right. I think that's a good place to end it. Moving on now to our next story. The organized labor's hope for a new national minimum wage appears to have been dashed as the federal government failed to announce an offer to beat the Workers' Day deadline. However, the labor union has given the government until the end of May to meet its demand for 615,000 naira minimum wage. Otherwise, it will no longer be able to guarantee industrial peace in Nigeria. The government says the new national minimum wage, once ready, will be backdated to take effect from May 1st, 2024. Arise News correspondent Omo Bazwai reports. On the occasion of this year's International Workers' Day, Nigerian workers joined the tradition that celebrates the struggle of workers across the world every May Day with a team, People First, that seems to resonate with their demand back home. It's a celebration that has endured for over 130 years when 300 workers took their destiny in their own hands to demand better working conditions. In Nigeria, organized labor NLC and TUC followed in the footsteps, insisting on a new national minimum wage of 615,000 Naira, which they consider as a living wage, while saying that anything short than that would be unacceptable. The battle for our new national minimum wage wages our demand for 615,000 Naira stands firm, rooted in the grim reality of workers' lives across the nation. At the Eagle Square venue of this year's national celebration, the hopes of workers for a new minimum wage to be announced seemed dashed after government failed to announce any amount. But the government, through the Minister of State for Labor in Kiruka Oyojocha, however, announced that the new minimum wage will take effect from the 1st of May 2024. However, all of that will be after government and labor are able to conclude on what is realistic and truly reflects the current economic situation in the country. The Nigerian workers should be rest assured that despite the short delay, the minimum wage will take effect on 1st, from 1st May, 2024. We are not going to lose any time. The workers say the triple policies of fuel subsidy removal, flotation of the Naira and hike in electricity tariff have combined to unleash untold hardship on them and have issued a new ultimatum to government to come up with its own offer before the end of May. The Nigerian Labour Congress and TUC have made it clearly and emphatically that should the minimum wage negotiation continue and linger till the end of May, we can no longer guarantee industrial harmony in this country. We reject unilateral and illegal tariff hike and demand adherence to due process. The NLC and TUC hereby advise NEC and power sector operators to revise the last increase in electricity tariff within the next one week. The Labour Union rejects government gift of 25 to 30% pay rise 
on the eve of workers day saying it is not the same as minimum wage and a deliberate attempt by government to cause confusion and shift attention away from the new minimum wage that is backed by law. The fact that they are trying to do it now, we suspect the intention. Why will they announce it now to create confusion? For over four years, the people, the National Public Service Negotiating Council have been asking for this harmonization. So if they are harmonizing it now, fine and good, but it's not a wage review. Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shetima led the government delegation to the Workers' Day celebration where the Senate President Gospel Apabio, in a speech entitled Solidarity Forever, re-echoed the plight of the Nigerian workers with the promise that the National Assembly is committed to their welfare. You recall that on January 30th, 2024, the federal government convened a 37-member tripartite committee on minimum wage. Unfortunately, despite concerted efforts, the committee was unable to reach a consensus at its last meeting. This shall be resolved soon, and I assure you that you are there supporting our own. Despite the current harsh economic realities that has dimmed the hope of many and weakened the purchasing power of many Nigerian workers, many of them have made it here at the Eagle Square with their hearts and cap full of pride and happy to be able to contribute to the wealth of a nation, a wealth they hope would sooner rather than later translate into a better life for them. Omo Bazwai, Arise News. Well, five years after the Minimum Wage Act of 2019 was signed off by President, uh, ex-President Muhammadu right. Buhari. I mean, so the, we see that the NLC, of course, is well within their rights to ask for this increase. But I think the biggest thing for me about this one is they had already said, okay, the deadline is May 1st. So, you know, everybody was waiting, you know, holding their breath to see if the federal government would at least meet them halfway. But their May 1st has come and gone. I think today is the 4th of May. And it still looks as if nothing, you know, nothing has changed. And when you think about the fact that there are still certain states that have not even been able to pay the 30,000 Naira that was approved way back in 2019, it talks, you know, it speaks to how realistic this 615,000, this new ask of the minimum wage. And when I say realistic, not necessarily in the sense that they should not be paid that, but how much can these different states governments afford to pay their workers and make sure that they, are, they still have enough money to run other things. But when you think about how realistic it is in the sense of what that does for the Ni Nigerian worker. 30,000 Naira cannot do anything. And I remember I was watching an interview with uh, the president of the NLC and they had done a breakdown of what that 615,000 Naira would do. Um, you know, we spoke about um, housing for accommodation for 40,000, which he also reiterated that really and truly, what can 40,000 Naira do as regards to accommodation, electricity, he said, will come to about 20,000. Still, again, not necessarily as realistic. He spoke about, you know, kerosene and gas coming to about 35,000. He looked at clothing, education. I mean, he broke it all down and said that that is the only way the Nigerian worker can survive. And this is even speaking to at living at the most basic level considering a family of four being able to feed themselves. I mean, a bag of rice goes for 85,000 Naira now. So how do you expect a full family to live on 30,000? But we continue to wait and see. Um, hopefully something is going to be done soon because what they are threatening against, I mean, what, they are, what they are going to say, what they're saying is going to happen is a lack of industrial peace. We already have, you know, high tariffs. We have bad electricity. We have fuel queues coming back. Nigeria is hot right now. Thankful, thankful for the rains that have happened in the past two days. But we don't need an extra element that's just going to make things worse for the Nigerian people. So something has to be done. Meet them halfway. That's what I have to say. Mr. Steve. Well, I mean, <laughs> you're very correct. Um, what is realistic? Uh, I, I do not think that um, uh, that should apply to the NLC and the Nigerian worker alone. Uh, how realistic uh, is it that an average federal lawmaker earns 700,000 Naira a day? Uh, and we're arguing as to uh, the propriety otherwise of uh, an average worker uh, earning or proposing to earn 615,000. It may not happen, but it's a discussion. That's a process at which you 
uh, that leads to um, a national minimum wage, which is an act of law. You can run away from it. Mm. You know, uh, there are processes and procedures as to, you know, uh, when you are supposed to uh, review it and things like that. But given what has happened in the last one year, uh, the rate of inflation caused by the policies that are meant to bring goodies to Nigerians, uh, uh, the removal of fuel subsidy, uh, the devaluation of the Naira as a result uh, of the of the proposed merger, because we still haven't seen a convergence, mm -hmm. you know, of rates, you know, uh, uh, of the of the Naira to a dollar, and lately uh, the increase in the electricity tariff. Even though the Minister of, of Power will want you to believe that it applies to only 15% of the, of the population. I mean, to, to start with, I totally condemn, I disagree <laughs> in totality with the idea uh, uh, of segregation, and the idea of, you know, the apathy, apathy mm. in Bande, Bande, and something. That is something, that is a product that you are duty bound to give to every Nigerian and let them pay for it. Supply and let them pay for it. The apathy in it you know, it, it, it's totally wrong. But coming to the point is, when you say it applies to only 15% of the population, what is the percentage of those 15%, you know, around the economy? So, looking at all the three issues that have happened in one year mm. of this present administration, the only thing that has not changed is the worth, the value, and the earnings of an average worker in Nigeria. Yes, there have been a few interventions here and there, palliative. Yes, there have been a couple of awards of uh, uh, a wage awards, you know, like a dash, basically, <laughs> to certain categories of workers. But, you know, uh, we do not. It, it has to be a legal thing. It's an act of law uh, that you have to, when you have to uh, 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 propose a minimum wage. It is sad that we couldn't achieve that on Labor Day. Maybe the president is waiting till May 29 when, you know, when it will clock one year. That's fine. And the Labour NLC and the TUC have said, we will wait mm, yes. at least till that time to see what will happen. But what is not encouraging is that the committee that the federal government set up to, to liaise with uh, the Labour leadership has not been meeting. Mm -hmm. And it is obvious that they are not as eager, you know, uh, as the workers. Uh, we can, uh, if, if we can't afford for Labour to end what is decent, then it, 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 it should speak to, to common sense that we also cannot afford what we are giving elected officers who mm -hmm. probably ought to be on part-time arrangement as of today, yes. given our reality, which was why I started with the point of reality when we said that, what is the reality? If 650,000 Naira will not work for an average worker, should millions of Naira on a monthly basis work for a federal lawmaker or for a political appointee, you know, uh, 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 ETC. So... Uh, it's a conversation that we must continue to have. Yeah, and knee jack arrangements, yes, we should commend where necessary. Knee jack arrangements, like what uh, the Edo State Governor yeah. has done, Obaseki, you know, moving it to 70,000. 70, and it says that oh, it's a living way because pay, people must be uh, uh, well paid. Well paid when what you have done, even though 100% more than the abysmal 30,000 is commendable. But well, that's not well paid. It can't even, the total package. When you remove taxes, cannot even buy a bag of rice, yes. just like you said. So don't don't over celebrate what is not. It, it's a good start, but we know that if you look at the productivity uh, ratio of our neighboring Nigeria to GDP and everything, uh, we should be looking at about a hundred and fifty thousand naira uh, a month. Will Nigerian government be able to afford it? The answer shouldn't be yes or no. It should be take it in. In a holistic way and address other people mm -hmm. who are earning unimagin unimaginable yeah. salaries. I mean, we must always ask our government to have people focused policy. People focused policy. You know, I was I was I was repulsed by uh, Jurian Galali's uh, statements on TVC recently <laughs> talking about Nigeria and Nigeria is living a better life than they were a month ago. I think it was very disingenuous and I think what we are facing right when now... When they spoke about their the purchasing power. Power has increased, increased greatly <laughs> in, in the last month. I think it, it was absolutely abhorrent. It was 
intellectually dis dishonest out, out of touch with reality you know it's, it's so bizarre if you're speak I, I hope you're not speaking for the president <laughs> when you're speaking in that manner because that is that was a shock to my own system i must say but you know let's <laughs> that's all on the week that was maybe he was referring to his own purchasing power but he <laughs> not the purchasing power of an Amri Nigeria well let me know that's all on the week that was but let's take a look at a few stories that are making the rounds on this day and we'll start in the U.S. with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has charged an auditing firm hired by Trump Media and Technology Group just 37 days ago with massive fraud. The SEC charged the accounting firm B.F. Borges and its owner, Benjamin F. Borges, with deliberate and systematic failures in more than 1,500 audits. The charges include failing to abide by accounting rules, fabricating documentation to cover up its shortcomings, and falsely stating in audit reports that its work met audit standards. As the case continues, Trump's former aide, Hope Hicks, testified on Friday that he told her in the final days of the 2016 presidential election to deny that he had a sexual relationship with porn star Stormy Daniels. Hicks testified... Hicks' testimony gave jurors an inside look at the campaign's damage control efforts when Trump faced multiple accusations of unflattering sexual behavior in the waning weeks of his successful White House campaign. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges. Meanwhile, the United Nations is warning that an Israeli incursion in Rafah would put the lives of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians at risk. Israel has repeatedly warned of an operation against Hamas in the southern Gazan city, where more than 1.5 million displaced people are crowded together. James Larkey, the spokesperson for the UN Humanitarian Office, said an assault on Rafah would be a slaughter of civilians and an incredible blow to the humanitarian operation in the entire Strip. The UN is preparing for the attack by building more hospitals, but warns nothing will stop a substantial number of deaths. And we'll move on. A special offences court sitting in Lagos has adjourned proceedings till May 9th for the defence to study an additional proof of evidence submitted by the prosecution in the ongoing trial of former CBN governor Godwin Emefiele. The court expressed satisfaction with the argument of the defence counsel seeking an adjournment of proceedings. Mefele's counsel had argued that the prosecution had filed an additional proof of evidence which he needed enough time to study. Although the prosecution counsel urged the court to dismiss the defense counsel's prayers, arguing that it will amount to an unnecessary delay of the trial, the court ruled in favor of the defense.